Hello and welcome to today's Vanilla Plus Thought Leadership Webinar. I'm George Malin, editor of Vanilla Plus, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Karina Balucha, Marketing and Alliances Director at Computaris, and Stephen Hartley, Principal Analyst at Ovum. As we all know, mobile data consumption is growing exponentially, and that is putting enormous pressure on operators as they seek to address the twin challenges of providing excellent customer experiences and monetizing their network investments effectively. Policy management is at the heart of that, but how should it be done? Rigid, inflexible caps that either throttle down speed or cut off users when a specific consumption level is reached are simplistic and alien to the customer. After all, megabytes are meaningless to most. It's the experience that counts. No user will be happy to have a video session stalled when they reach a threshold. Equally, operators would be foolish to miss the opportunity of an upsell when a cap is reached. We need to move beyond simply setting caps to protect the network and look at policy management in the context of the customer experience and as a means to stimulate revenue growth. To do that, greater insight into the customer is required. That must be flexible in order to take account of different customers' consumption and requirements. It must also be able to adapt in real time so customers can enjoy freedom in their mobile experiences. Nobody wants the choppy experience currently on offer from many operators who spend far too much time focusing on ensuring that the network is healthy and not enough time focusing on making sure that customers are satisfied. Instead of looking upon policy management as a medicine to cure the network's data consumption burden, it should be used as a vitamin to stimulate the operator's ability to generate profits from its assets. Such solutions need to be scalable and able to extend to meet future demands. We're not certain what those demands are yet, but the systems we deploy now must be ready for today's burdens and, the, and challenges and simultaneously position the operator for whatever the future holds. Importantly, this capability exists. We are not dreaming of a distant future. Karina and Stephen will discuss this in far greater detail. So without further delay, I'll hand over to Stephen Hartley. Stephen. Thank you very much. What I'd like to do um, initially is just really to introduce some of the themes that George um, mentioned in his introduction and go into a little bit more detail on, on our research and where we think mobile broadband as a whole is heading. So we start off with some connections forecasts around what we believe the mobile broadband market will look like. And actually, at a very simple level, that's got to be great, hasn't it? You know, you've got 20% KGAR on the big screen segment, so the, the laptops and the USB modems type of segment, and then a 24% KGAR in the small screen. Smartphones start um, picking up um, around the world. Surely it can only be positive. And from a customer perspective, you're also starting to um, see how you can collect or um, view your content and use data anywhere, anytime, anyhow. We have the rise in tablets. We have the rise in smartphones. But we're also seeing connectivity being built into television sets. And that's enabling customers to access all sorts of, of data services. And we'll come back to the fact of, of what some of these logos displayed on the screen actually mean to an operator a little bit later on. But it's worth just looking at the fact that we've got Beidou in China, or Cook in India, where this isn't a, a developed market, the rich West sort of situation. This is actually a global phenomenon. And here's some, some data that um, we've collected through a, a consumer survey. And it shows that the type of data that people are consuming is changing. So here we start seeing video content and the types of video content that people want. So from a mobile phone or a portable media player or a tablet, lots of internet video clips involving streaming video. Um, as George said, you don't want that to break mid-session. So suddenly the, the customer experience changes from what we have today, which is you'll get the content as and when the, the network decides to deliver it, to requiring constant access. And also as well, in terms of 
the impact on the customer, the commercial activity that the, that huge demand is stimulating means that actually customers can can get their data from anywhere, from integrated operators, from mobile operators, from fixed operators. And actually, there's a whole host of, of tariffs available through which they can purchase access to these services. But as we all know, every silver lining has a cloud. And this is referencing Cisco's visual networking index and really is highlighting the fact that we have this huge growth in traffic, but actually moving forward, it's expected to grow even more. So, um, excuse me, 26 times growth between 2010 and 2015. But it's not just the absolute volume that is increasing, it's the type of data. Two thirds of the world's mobile data traffic will be video by 2015. And it's the type of devices that are consuming this data. So tablets in 2015 consuming as much as global mobile networks in 2010. This is a huge management, operational, and investment issue for the world's telcos. And as if to compound the problem, the sheer competitive intensity that we're seeing around the world in telecoms markets really manifests itself in the outlook for mobile broadband revenues. And so here, if we contrast with the connections growth, we're seeing a discount on the CAGA over the next five years in relation to big screen and small screen revenues versus those connections. So now we have this let's say, perfect storm where we have huge demand, which is stimulating a lot of uh, commercial interest from the operators. That's driving increased traffic, which is stimulating the pressure on the network. And at the same time, the revenues don't keep pace. And it's worth noting that LTE, the, <laughs> the, the latest savior of, of the mobile world, isn't really going to provide us with a killer application as such, a killer experience. And it may enable some applications to perform better or more efficiently, more reliably. And it's also worth noting that as you get more and more competition in LTE today, you're starting to see um, that actually LTE doesn't necessarily differentiate the competitive landscape. Pricing still remains key very difficult for operators to break that cycle of cost cutting. Certainly here from, from our research into uh, the Swedish LTE players, it's clear that there are large premiums being charged over 3G services. That's undeniable. But how long can they remain? Certainly the experience in Asia and in North America um, is showing that not necessarily for very long. Um, yes. We'll certainly see some differentiation through things like uh, different devices. The iPhone type of device for, for LTE is certainly going to arrive at some point, and we've already seen how those sorts of devices can stimulate churn from one operator to another. But ultimately, we're not really seeing differentiation through particular applications over LTE. And actually, what you are starting to see is more creative segmentation, um, certainly in Germany and also in Sweden as well. There are um, plans available that are segmented by different speeds to segment the market and enable operators to uh, understand how their customers are using the services. And there's another side to this issue, which is the fact that if there's no LTE killer app, can operators earn an uptick in revenues to overcome the investment needed on the network? And here we have a chart showing our, our forecast for the value-added services globally over the next five years. And these are the revenues that go to operators on, on this particular chart. And that's just a 0.65 CAGR over the next five years. Now, this next chart. This shows us the revenues from application downloads. 
and the volume of application downloads on a global basis. And so this is revenue that is going to operators, other third parties, the Apples, the Googles of this world. And here, the significant thing is the CAGR is at 16%. The absolute values in terms of the revenue opportunity might be very similar to the VAS services. And, but the application opportunity for operators makes up only a small part of that VAS revenue. If you just look at the application opportunity, it's quite clear that the bulk of those revenues aren't going to operators. And just to muddy the waters even more, operators are having to work in much more complicated ecosystems than previously to try and exploit any opportunities that do arise. So here's a very simple view of mobile payments, where we suddenly have new regulators, new competitors in the forms of banks, new agents and resellers, new government agencies becoming involved, NGOs becoming involved becomes very, very complicated, and the operator may not be able to seize control of the value chain, maybe in the way it has done in the past. And then we come to the fact that really, despite the, the technical challenges um, and the network infrastructure issues, business models have to change. The all-you-can-eat model we're seeing um, get eaten away, if you excuse the pun. But actually, it can be profitable under the right circumstances. It is possible, particularly for disruptor operators um, that have relatively empty networks and relatively new infrastructure, to use that to challenge the market leaders. Certainly, tiered pricing, and I think by an average speed or a typical speed rather than a peak speed, makes a lot of sense. It enables you to segment your audience. It enables you to upsell, gives you that path um, as, as you move forward. It's also very important, I think, to apply fair usage policies. Users have to pay for excessive data. It's as simple as that. Um, in the mobile space, Spectrum is a finite resource and shared. Therefore, the operators almost have an obligation to make sure that everyone can have access. And we're also seeing that the continued rise in service bundling meaning that maybe the way we see some of these services being priced in the future isn't going to look terribly um, similar to how it does today. So to sum up, there is undoubted demand for mobile data. That's almost a given. But the network investment that's needed to meet the ensuing traffic demand means that operators are under intense pressure to get a return on that investment. But the customers can look elsewhere. They can look to fixed operators. They can look to integrated operators. They can look to other mobile operators. And of course, they can also look to internet players. It's not just a telco-centric world anymore. And it's also worth noting that LTE is long-term evolution. The name says it all. It's going to take time for it to make a difference on the cost basis. It's going to take time for any new services to reap dividends, and charging a premium won't necessarily last forever. But the key thing that the operators can do is adapt the business models, learn to live in new ecosystems in new ways. And that really is, is how we see the mobile broadband space panning out over the next five years. Um, and at that point, I shall hand over to Karina. Thank you, Stephen. That was fascinating. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to remind all the participants that uh, the panel will be open for questions, and we'll take all those questions at the end. So, so please enter your uh, your questions in the uh, in the Q and A panel uh, of of the online console. Um, I'm now delighted to turn to uh, Karina Bulucha. Uh, who's Marketing and Alliances Director at Computaris. Uh, Karina is going to explore the issues that operators face as they become active participants across the entire value-added services revenue chain. Uh, she will share her view of how operators are the enablers and chargers of over-the-top services and how that gives them a unique position of strength in the market. Uh, Karina. Th thank you, George. And uh, thanks, Stephen, also for your introduction and insight. In the webinar today, I'm planning to make uh, not particularly a case regarding a certain policy management strategy, 
but rather build further the perspective on challenges that operators are facing today regarding data traffic and balancing this with the requirement to increase their competitiveness. What are the consequences of this increased accessibility of data across access networks? And how is it reflected in service innovation? How can operator monetize and leverage this huge potential before it become commoditized? This analysis will lead to identify drivers for early adopting policy management strategies and the criteria for choosing the best implementation approach for your business as waiting is not an option. I could not help noticing Stephen's characterization of data growth impact on mobile providers. Every silver lining has a cloud. You can say that, but I'd use a different comparison, the butterfly effect. A newly, a rather marginal industry segment that booms is about to revolutionize the entire communication paradigm. Service providers need to seize the moment and early adopt strategies to take advantage of this opportunity which presents themselves. Growth in the mobile data consumption was more often than not generated by innovation coming entirely from outside the telecom world. The boom of service innovation coming from OTT providers the evolution of devices like smartphones, netbooks, and other consumer electronics, the huge growth in social media consumption are all factors that drive consumption independent of influence of the mobile network providers. In the last couple of years, data traffic has actually changed the rules of the game, and Stephen created a clear image about that impact in his part of the webinar. In less than five years, networks that were once dominated by voice traffic have in many cases become dominated by data traffic. Most of this traffic is originating in the Internet and have characteristics completely different from legacy traffic. So operators struggle to identify, measure, manage, and monetize IP-based services. Due to the telecom network-centric view, the operators are prone to the early adopter of innovation due to engineering efficiency promises that new generation of technology will do much more for much less and fix the previous shortcomings. It should not come as a surprise that the natural rea reaction of operators to a large part of it is to invest huge budgets in infrastructure to satisfy the demand for data capacity. And the process is still ongoing for the vast majority of operators worldwide. As we can read from the press, we are witnessing a considerable increase in the availability of next generation networks and adoption of 4G. Currently, there are 18 commercially deployed LTE networks and another 180 planned deployments around the world. And this number is increasing constantly. This this underlines the operators are destined to follow the infrastructure roadmap, which you can see, as has already been mapped out. Current network access built out to 3G and IMS is meeting both the challenges of providing higher speed data service mobile and has boosted radio network capacity. These networks enable and perpetuate the change in subscriber behavior in being able to access a wide range of services anytime and anywhere, which previously was the prerogative of a fixed connection. As we all know, 4G promises to be an order of magnitude faster than 3G. Of course, like any other theoretical speed claims, real-world performance will differ significantly from WiMAX and LTE. But 4G promises users download speeds of 100 megabytes per second which is going to encourage even more service innovation. We can all agree that LTE is only an enabling technology and is not going to be a killer application, but it still changes the rules of the game. And even if, as it happens with the 3G, it will take a while between the inception and wider adoption of the LTE, 
it is still obvious indication that operators are willing to invest in the future and striving to adapt in order to keep being competitive and profitable. From my perspective, mobile network consumption is driven by three main drivers, device evolution, content innovation, and network enablement. Nowadays, customers expect seamless experience regardless of their size or number of the screens or the complexity involved in delivering the content. Up to 60% of mobile data traffic is generated by consumers watching video. The larger the screen, the more entertainment the device typically delivers. Netbooks, media tablet, smart TVs, and other devices larger than handsets mimic patterns seen in wired broadband usage, especially when it comes to video. The increasing uptake of such products is therefore a major driver. We are witnessing the launch of new generation of devices that are dedicated to the cloudy generation of people living online. Google's Chromebook offered onto the market earlier this year is just the beginning of a new era of connected devices, which is encouraged by the increasing adoption of cloud computing and the powerful brands investing heavily in this. The second important driver is the content. Lots of online services worldwide are cutting deals with content providers as content is the main driver for consumption. In 2011, we are witnessing the launch of streaming music and video services from Google and Facebook. And it's not only about these huge corporations. There are others such as content aggregators, for example Hulu in USA, providing view, viewing experience seamlessly across devices. Start watching on your phone, continue watching on your smart TV. Social media evolution should not be ignored either. Facebook just announced last week at the developers conference that they are now focusing on engagement. Consequence, since launching its tie-up tie-in with Facebook last Thursday, Spotify has reportedly added 250,000 new users every day. So operators have to seize the moment and find innovative ways to take advantage of this data traffic. They are still having a privileged connection and relationship with their customer that can allow them grow their share in the revenue generated and enhance further customer loyalty. I would argue that the key drivers for operators in the future are engagement with their customers and monetization of the services provided. Going back to the economics, in order to make the books balance, operators need to balance the demand for data with the supply costs. Beyond this, they need to provide added value services and create a differentiated proposition to generate profits, allow investment and growth. Easier than said than done, wouldn't you agree? Indeed, operators have to innovate and deliver cost-effective mobile broadband services to customers with increasing expectations, whilst generate new revenues from non-network services that are already dominated by OTT players, content providers, and device manufacturers. Sounds quite complicated if you put it like this. Mobile operators have to re recognize and address their current challenges, which vary depending on the local market developments. But even if we are placing the discussion in an emerging market where the challenges have not yet appeared, operators need to smartly learn from others' experience and get prepared for the future. Today, the capacity crunch is recognized by most operators in the mature markets where users' needs evolve much faster uh, than the growth in capacity network. Growth in demand for capacity has outstripped the growth in supply. Economic theory would suggest that prices will have to increase. 
However, unfortunately, the reality is different. The growth in revenue is much below the growth in consumption. And this is due to many factors, but beyond any doubt is that the flat rate is not a viable anymore. As users migrate from using wireline to wireless connection to IP, they expect data traffic to be virtually free based on their current web experience. Operators will need to combat this perception and put a value on traffic, otherwise mobile broadband margins will continue to erode. In this area, operators in emerging markets have an advantage as the user's perception of having a right to access free bandwidth never materialized as the fixed network has limited reach. Over the top providers and the adoption of social media are already disrupting the communication landscape with the proliferation of bandwidth intensive application and content. Consequently, operators strive efficiently to exploit these opportunities before making any additional infrastructure investment and to create a mutually beneficial value proposition for all parties involved, content providers, operators, and users. Such an increase in data usage has a serious impact on every operator's business, as they cannot afford to let traffic flood their networks without ensuring that sustainable new revenue streams follow. The good news is that operators can leverage their native capabilities in their network and BSS to create value by adopting the proper data management strategy. Service providers face a new dilemma. Despite explosive mobile data growth, data ARPU is not increasing proportionately and is not offsetting the sharply declining voice revenues. Social networking is a popular substitute for traditional voice phone calls, but does not generate the equivalent revenue. Content providers and device manufacturers are partnering and deriving the benefits of the broadly accessible mobile network yet network operators are falling behind. The unprecedented growth rate is exceeding operators' ability to expand network capacity. As a result, mobile broadband policy management has become one of the hottest topics in the industry. Furthermore, the transition to LTE will maintain the momentum around policy because policy control is even more central in 4G than in 3G networks. Policy is almost compulsory if voice services migrate to IP, and prioritized key application, including voice, is required. 4G investment will also increase the pressure on operators to use policy to differentiate and monetize services. So, starting with the beginning, what's policy all about? is a set of rules that enables operators with relevant capacity to take dynamic decisions and grant differentiated access to service for different customer segments in accordance to their consumption patterns. Better allocate network resources and better manage congestion burdens, being able to offer an increased quality of service for customers that generate most of the data traffic. Policy can also empower subscribers to manage their own mobile data usage. And most relevant, a policy management allows operator to launch personalized promotions and take decisions based on subscriber's device, usage patterns, location, the source and the type of traffic, and many other segmentation criteria. That means that policy management will address three main issues. Network congestion management through real-time network application and subscriber policy. Service planning based on subscribers' behavior and cons consumption habits. And managing demand generated by devices and new business model evolution. Ideally, the available leverages of a policy management strategy should be implemented gradually as need arises. Policy rules 
such as access control, bandwidth allocation, fair usage, and traffic prioritization are fair straightforward and already widely commercially launched. Subscribers can control their usage and operators can optimize their network resources and increase transparency towards their users. But in order to create a valuable proposition to market, operators should look beyond cost control and regulatory requirements, which was the industry approach so far. Because although this might encourage consumption, it does not necessarily generate new revenue streams. All these benefits come with a considerable shift in business organization. Policy and charging is no longer the exclusive prerogative of network and IT teams, and is not just a cost to protect the network. These functions become critical in supporting service providers in achieving their goals at all levels, touching everything from the customer experience to the technical setup. It gives operators means to personalize offers towards each category of customers without increase their cost of customer and business support functions. This is a compelling argument when you are trying to create differentiated packages and engage with users' needs. Last but very important, this functionality can be exposed to the users themselves and put them in control. You could have a boost package where extra bandwidth is made available for a film or an important file, or parents can control what their children consume and when it is consumed. It offers customers full control on their services, which brings confidence to consume more. It unleashes business and marketing creativity in providing customized services and suitable bundles for each customer's niche without spending a huge IT budget for implementation. Therefore, the utmost importance is to improve bandwidth traffic monetization, operators need to involve towards subscriber-centric bandwidth management and provides real-time interactivity so that customer can enjoy their mobile experience. Most operators so far have implemented a network-centric management to optimize the network usage by imposing caps and limits on subscribers' usage and monetary exposure. The most common application in this area relates to build shock service for roaming data traffic imposed by regulators. After the user reaches his limit, he sends a text message with an update. Usually, this happens at the end of the day. In our opinion, this is the right idea, but the wrong outcome. By the time the user knows they reach their limit, they may have already overspent and their hasty reaction is to stop all data usage out of fear. The customer is unhappy, and the operator loses potential revenue. But how familiar is this scenario? It probably happened to all of us one time or another. On the other hand, user-centric bandwidth management provides information and interactivity in real time so customers are in control of their own usage. Armed with information and options, the customer can then make decisions and purchases without fear of hidden charges and unfair depletion of their data bundle. The customer knows immediately if an Internet person pounds against their cap. He has options and knows immediately that a certain download will cost so much due to the amount of traffic on the network. A practical solution would be to offer him an extra bolt-on just before the capacity threshold is reached to increase revenue and keep a good user experience. In any case, customer remains in control and knows immediately when he is getting close to his roaming limit. Therefore, 
he becomes a willing partner rather than an unwitting pawn. This real-time interactivity with your customer fosters tapping a wide range of opportunities that market brings currently. For example, another widespread application is parental or enterprise control, aimed at monitoring content access based on customer-defined rules and managing cost control. This creates a valuable differentiator for the service provider and increased long-term loyalty. Evolving devices and rising of new business models brings new challenges that operators choose how to approach in their own way. Either to fight back, as innovation usually erodes current revenue streams, or they can choose to adopt valuable changes and maximize the new generated revenue stream, sometimes benefiting of early adopters' advantages. Cost reduction is just one side of the equation. Operators can now create new service bundles that move away from flat rate plans available to everyone towards tiered and usage-based prices, supported by subscriber, service, and policy control. The key to profitability is offering real-time provisioning, metering, and charging flexibility for evolving services. This would allow operator to differentiate by creativity in defining new services and bundles suitable for each market segment they define, each device, and each new application or content available. There are currently references of commercially tested service bundles. Tiered usage based on time, data, volume, or application type. Bundles based on access method. Fixed and mobile data, this is mainly in Europe, or Wi-Fi and mobile broadband. Postpaid or prepaid data access or any combination of the two. There are also possible value-added content bundles. For example, mobile access to all social network services is very common use in most mature markets. The innovation here would be to monetize the user's engagement and use this engagement to upsell or increase loyalty. An innovative type of bundle is wholesale model based on device or content. An early uh, model is Kindle, where the traffic cost is built in the service. As a matter of fact, these models are prone to grow consistently as new businesses model evolved. And here, the sky is the limit. But in order to implement all this service bundle innovation, one of the most important challenges acknowledged already by operators is the integration of policy and charging for real-time metering and monetization of newly enabled services. With this capacity of monetization, the operator can define their role in the new content-driven ecosystem and move away from the dump pipe threat. The future growth of the mobile communication industry is essentially linked to the development of other industries. Mobile service providers had long ago identified new business models based on new devices and technologies and covering subscribers' needs outside the communication world. The industry has been speaking for a while about huge applicability of M2M connected devices, smart grids for utility services, smart cities, and so on. We have spoken about M-Health, M-Education, M-Payments, M-Commerce, or M-Marketing. According to a 2011 UMTS forum analysis, the largest area for future growth in mobile communication is in consumer electronics devices, such as games, e-reading devices, in-vehicle entertainment, home appliances, or healthcare. 
mobile broadband will enable the flexible and cost-effective deployment of always-on, anywhere devices for the consumer. By 2015, non-traditional consumer electronic devices like connected tablets, augmented rea reality games, robots, or telepresence system should be the fastest growing mobile broadband device class. New business models will develop, moving away from single device, single SIM, single consumer focused models to flexible models bundling devices, users, and traffic. Operators might choose to encourage partnership with such new business models for specific application. Already in place are ebook or home security models. Moreover, Operators need to drive these opportunities by proactively engagement and possibly perform roles beyond connectivity, such as technology platform management, parts of the customer experience management, or acting as a route to market. Content players are very keen and actively seeking to exploit new distribution paths. Enabling and encouraging the federation of devices and content from many different sources, operators differentiate themselves and increase their contribution in this market. One size fits all never worked, not even in case of mobile broadband flat fee charging. Each operator, based on its market environment, network architecture, and most important, based on business goals, need to formulate its own policy strategy. But then again, learning from previous experience, your own or others, is the way innovation pushed further. I hope you'll allow me a very broad classification of markets and their general requirements. For emerging markets, there are some common characteristics that will influence the policy strategy. Competition or consolidation with the wireline access is not viable, as wireline access is not developed enough. But the number of subscribers is huge, and mobile broadband is their only access to Internet. Some changes in usage could present a large impact and challenge the data network if not addressed. Handsets accessibility is improving as the price barrier are lowering. And moreover, we also need to see the opportunity of other mobile large screen devices being available on the market. As in some markets, availability of access has improved rapidly, sometimes jumping from no access whatsoever to 3G+. Although Internet penetration is very low, under 10%, the growth trend is enormous and operators need to be prepared. And last but not least, operators do not have to change predetermined fixed broadband access habits, which is an important advantage. For mature market, challenges are a totally different nature. Their main aim is to get back the infrastructure investment in very tough condition. A large number of operators have integrated fixed and mobile networks, so they need to cautiously approach the service and revenue cannibalization issue. Customers require more control and flexibility, both in pricing models as well as in the quality of service supplied. Flexible, dynamic, and personalized pricing models that reflect subscribers' preferences and context, bandwidth and application usage, and network conditions are the wave of the future. This new pricing model will better align data revenue and network costs for the first time. Mature markets will be the one where consolidation will be first tried between different players of the newly formed ecosystem. As mentioned before, we are going to assist in teaming up between content providers, OTT providers, 
solution vendors and communication channels to provide required level of service for a more sophisticated customer. Broadband data services, particularly over mobile, will determine customer behavior. A good experience with the right type of service will improve retention rates and enhance loyalty. Therefore, when considering what type of policy solution is most suitable, it is imperative to keep in mind the growth trajectory, uh, trajectory projected for mobile broadband. To future profit, the solution needs to be highly scalable and adaptable to evolving business needs. Operators should implement the kind of policy management solution that creates synergies between it and the real-time converging charging solution. This will enable them to become active participants in the value-added service ch value chain by easily enabling and charging over-the-top services and by applying value-based service pricing strategies. Supported by such an infrastructure, operators will better adapt to changes and exploit all opportunities from the communication market. Overall, operators need to resolve the following equation to close the revenue gap and make mobile data more profitable. Increase mobile data revenue, and that is create new revenue models, capture new customer, make purchases easier, increase customer lifetime value. Then they need to minimize cost by optimizing network resources utilization, minimizing costly customer service resources. And the most important, keep customer happy. Put the focus on customer. Offer a compelling experience and a quality of service that drives loyalty. This also means providing the flexibility, personalization, control, simple pricing, and transparency that they expect. Vendors evaluation, as any technology selection processes, it's hard, long, expensive, and very risky. While several vendors may provide solutions that are at first glance meeting all the needs, Various differences can include solution flexibility, various approaches to training, implementation support, after implementation support, upgrade burdens, business policies, or legal risks. So I'll quickly go through the main criteria operators should take into consideration whilst choosing a policy management solution vendor. Of course, such a vendor should have relevant experience and references, if possible, in the same geographical area or countries with similar economic and regulatory environment. The vendor should offer a modular, configurable, cost-effective policy solution, enabling the operator to upgrade and implement new functionalities as new needs appear. The policy platform should enable multi-vendor operability, have a clear evolution path as part of a solution roadmap, and it should have track record of focus on innovation. The vendor of choice should be able to offer tailored made, best of breed pre-integrated solution. As new policy use case emerge and uh, evolve, operators will benefit from the implementation of the most scalable, flexible, and well-integrated solution. As policy becomes more sophisticated and widespread, it will require massive scaling up in the policy engine in terms of transaction or sessions handled, as well as better integration with other elements of the policy architecture. And the most important point of integration that allow future proofing is real-time charging as a revenue generator for existing service bundles as well as from encouraging new business models. Second important item is the scalability of the solution. So it can accommodate 
this extension towards new business models from a quality of service and quality of experience perspective. So our advice is implement a policy management solution sooner rather than later to take a pole position advantage in the data-driven communication environment. Even if you are tempted for very good reason, no doubt, to address short-term challenges with short-term workarounds, this will prove to be totally inefficient in long term. The data revolution is here to stay, and sooner rather than later, operators will need to adopt an effective policy management strategy to maintain profitability. And at that point, any previous workaround will prove to be, in fact, a waste of time and budget. So to conclude this webinar, I'd like to highlight three items for your further consideration. First thing would be policy management goes beyond managing the supply capacity and should be subscriber-centric. Then new business ecosystem require entirely new approach. Early adoption of a policy management will bring competitive advantage. And last but not least, to generate new revenue streams, policy needs to be deeply integrated with the PSS and particularly with the charging. I'd like to close by observing that Computari stands ready to assist with additional information on any of these policy management technologies or their implementation. I also take this opportunity to thank Stephen Hartley and Ovum for joining me in this webinar. And I'll pass the microphone to George back to see if there are any questions. Thank you, Thank Sabrina. You, that, was, uh, that was fascinating. We've, we've had a couple of questions in, and um, do feel free to continue to send in your questions. But uh, the first question I have, I'm going to um, direct to Stephen Hartley. Um, and the question is, LTE doesn't change the picture. It's just another network technology. Um, so is it a red herring when it comes to how operators should set policy strategy? Uh, Stephen. Um, I think it's, it's a good question as much as... It, you would think, wouldn't you, that uh, the traffic issues we're talking about get solved by putting bigger pipes in. But I, I think, as Karina has um, gone through in her slides, um, it actually becomes even more important to have policy management in the LTE environment. And I think the reason is for in lots of different directions, really. You, you've got the new business opportunities and new applications and services that can be deployed. So. For example, a particular piece of traffic may not be terribly important, but it could be very valuable from a revenue perspective, um, sort of M-commerce type of applications, for example, or it could be um, the real-time nature of the traffic is very important, and here I'm thinking maybe public safety or security cameras, for example, would be very useful. And then you can come out into the, let's say, the wider consumer-centric world, and, and I think policy management is very important just simply for tariffing and, and segment segmenting your customers and allowing them to find a, a price point that suits their need and their usage. And that's very important for the operators from a commercial perspective, simply because it enables them to serve those customers, improve that particular customer's experience lower the churn, and in a fiercely competitive market, it becomes very important. So I think the whole area of OSS and BSS is actually often overlooked when it comes to LTE. I think LTE is often seen as deployed in the network and then just leave it to get on with it, when actually it is about shifting how you run your business and then how you run that traffic over the network. Um, so I think it, it's probably a red herring to say that... Uh, Policy management in LTE is a red herring, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Stephen. I think what's interesting is policy management is applicable to so many uh, streams of, of the operator business. Um, and we've got a question here that I'm going to direct to Karina. Um, the question is, uh, is about MBNOs and, and MBNEs, uh, and that's obviously an interesting uh, subset of the market. So uh, I'll read out the question and then uh, pass over to Karina for an answer. The question is, operators are increasingly embracing the MBNO, MBNE business model. Does a policy management solution 
resolution have any impact on this business uh, and, and can it bring additional opportunities, uh, Karina? Thank you, George. Well, this is indeed a great question. Actually, MVN nodes are another strong reason why operators should consider implementing such a policy management solution. To shortly answer your question, yes, a policy management solution has a great impact on the MVNO business. And uh, just a few benefits. It enables the operator to host MVNOs which are bill shock regulation compliant. And this is um, a must in, uh, for an MVNO to work in EU. It enables the operator to set differentiated quality of service for each MVNO, another very important point. And uh, last but not least, it enables the operator to increase its mobile data consumption by hosting data-centric MVNO, which exclusively focus on addressing mobile data customers. Consequent consequently, they are taking a piece of MVNO's data consumption revenue pie. I hope this answers the question. Uh, yes, thank you, Karina. There's just one more question uh, has come in while you were talking. Uh, it, it concerns um, how operators can uh, can generate revenue from from all the work they do to, that supports the business of third parties. Uh, I think the questioner probably means that uh, you know, thinking of OTT providers that uh, run all their services over carrier networks, but the carrier doesn't actually get to monetize; they just get the consumption of capacity. Um, so, so the question is, how can policy help operators achieve value from their network investments? Uh, while they have to carry the huge volume of, of, uh, of third-party traffic. Okay, that's, why, why really an <laughs> that's really an important question for operators. Well, policy makes sure that the content of third parties reaches the customer with a proper quality of service, and they are ensuring the quality of experience as well. So, for example, a movie on demand without a quality of service can take one day to download and make the service unusable. In the same time, policy can charge the subscriber on a service used and not on the data traffic. Um, in case of video for for on demand, for example, um, a movie can be charged per movie rather than per volume of data, which is totally insignificant for the user. I don't really care how much data I'm going to spend. Uh, I care how much money I'm going to pay on a certain show. Sure. The internet bundle of the subscriber affected by the video on demand downloads. That can be another option as well. So you can create special bundles for video on demand. Okay, that's interesting. Um, but how can policy management encourage live TV proliferation? Okay, hmm. the largest challenge of live TV today is that it registers peaks. For example, during sport events like Football World Cup or Olympic Games. Uh, in this case, the quality of service decreases so much that uh, actually the service is becoming unusable. If uh, variable QoS is acceptable on video and demand, as uh, we discussed earlier, because of uh, some caching options. In case of live TV, if we have five to ten seconds of lousy quality, that makes you stop watching the, mo the show. Using policy management, you can correctly manage the quality of service, and you can make sure that the subscriber have enough bandwidth for as long as the service is in use. And this is an important element to maintain customer experience and to maintain customer loyalty. Okay, great. Um, I'm afraid we're out of time, um, so it only remains for me to thank uh, Karina and Stephen for sharing their insights today. Uh, it's been a fabulous um, session, and I, I found it very interesting uh, because it's so fundamental to the success of carrier business models of, of, of the future. So thanks to uh, all the attendees, and, and thank you for the people that asked questions, uh, and, and thanks, of course, to Computaris. Uh, many thanks for joining today. Goodbye.